Hello everyone, this is Noah, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about joint locking techniques, or konsetsuwaza. Now, these types of techniques are present in a wide array of martial arts, but typically people tend to think of grappling arts like judo and jujitsu uh, when they're talking about joint locking techniques. In the case of joint locks, people tend to think of them in one way, and that is usually due to those grappling arts they're going to usually see them as controlling techniques. They are used to get the opponent to do a specific thing. Uh, now, in a competitive standpoint, that's looking at making your opponent uh, submit and tap out so that you can win, uh, or it's making them move in a certain way to try and escape the joint lock so that you can set them up for some other type of submission. On the other hand, in a more self-defense or law enforcement perspective, controlling joint locks can be used to get a suspect on the ground or to move in a certain direction uh, so that they can be arrested, controlled, restrained in some fashion. Now, those are typically how people see joint locks being applied. In karate and some of the other uh, older martial arts or uh, more self-defense oriented martial arts like Kali or Moi Baran, you'll see joint locks that are applied quickly. Uh, and these are what I would call joint wrenching techniques. Rather than joint locks that are meant to control, these are meant to do damage in a very fast uh, manner, very violent manner, so that you can then immediately move on to the next technique that you need to do. And this is something that isn't always seen in martial arts, and so people tend to think of joint locks as always being controlling techniques. And that actually has led to some discussions with uh, mixed martial artists especially, who will tend to think that standing joint locks, uh, such as those found in karate, uh, they'll tend to think those aren't very effective. And the reason for that is when someone's standing up, uh, they have a whole wide array of space uh, to move in so that they can avoid the joint lock. Whereas on the ground, it's much easier to apply a joint lock because with someone laying on their back, uh, someone laying on their side, if they're on the floor, they don't have as much range of motion uh, to be able to escape from a joint lock. So it's easier to uh, put them in a technique that you can control uh, and slowly apply for them to tap out. On the other hand, when someone's standing up, they can duck, they can twist, they can bend and crouch and turn and avoid the joint lock in a wide array of directions. This is where the joint wrenching really comes into play. If you have a lot of space to move in, then the only way to overcome that uh, as far as preventing your opponent from defending themselves from your own techniques would be to apply them very quickly. And you'll see this a lot in karate techniques. We can apply a joint lock, such as an arm bar or a shoulder lock or a wrist lock, slowly and controlled to try and put opponents on the floor, uh, to try and restrain people, to try and get people to tap out. But in the context of a self-defense situation, it may be more efficient to just wrench the joint and move on to strikes. And that is because if we wrench the shoulder out of place, if we wrench the elbow out of place, if we snap the wrist and do these things very quickly, the opponent won't have any time to use that space around them to move in and avoid the joint lock. At that point, we've disabled whichever joint we were attacking, hopefully, and that gives us now a leg up to enable us to land our strikes, to uh, get into a position to choke the opponent if necessary, throw the opponent if necessary, whatever the case may be. So whereas joint locks are often seen as something to control someone and uh, get them to give up, from the old style karate perspective, it's a lot more efficient to damage the opponent quickly and immediately move on to something else. Generally, for karate people, it's going to be striking since that's our primary method of uh, attacking someone uh, when we need to. So it's important to consider joint locks in your training in both ways, not just as controlling techniques, but also as wrenching techniques. 
Now in training with your partners, you'll have to be careful with this. You really have to do things in a more controlling manner in order to be safe. But there are ways to supplement your training so that you can incorporate the joint wrenching. Uh, you can let go when you apply joint lock so that you can work the mechanics quickly, uh, but your opponent escapes so that your partner doesn't get injured. Uh, alternatively, you can use tools like a kakya or kaketebiki uh, in order to emulate the arm of an opponent, which then you can apply a great deal of force to uh, without having to worry about injuring anyone. But no matter how you go about it, it is important to have this mentality. You need to understand that, yes, you can apply it slowly in a controlled manner so that you can try to get your opponent to do a specific thing, or you can apply it quickly and violently and move on to something that might end the fight.